Um, so yeah, so I am going to be uh, talking this afternoon on the world's fastest <clears throat> non-ballistic projectile. Um, and, and I am. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if the talk is going to be exactly what you're expecting, but I found on time to give it an interesting title and hopefully people will, will turn up. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to be talking um, about some work that I um, have been invited to present recently. I was invited across virtually, unfortunately, not really, uh, to the University of Lynchburg and uh, to uh, a sports aero workshop at uh, Technical University of Delft. Um, and I've also presented some of this work out at uh, Tokyo, uh, the ISEA 2020 conference virtually this year as well. And it's, it's, on, it's on shuttlecocks. And many of you will have seen me talk on uh, shuttlecocks before and are probably thinking, oh, no, not again. But what I wanted to do was to kind of give you kind of an update on, on where we're at with some of the projects that we've been ongoing with and um, where those projects are going and to give a bit of background as well to some people who might not understand why I spend all my time working with or spare time working with shuttlecocks. So as the title of the talk suggested, shuttlecocks are actually the world's fastest non-ballistic projectile. Um, Tan Boon Hyong, uh, is currently credited with the world's fastest uh, smash of a shuttlecock, 493 miles an hour, um, kilometers an hour, I should say. It was in a lab. It was part of a Yonex um, ads campaign uh, to demonstrate the power of their rackets. Um, but these projectiles regularly uh, reach velocities in excess of um, 150 plus miles an hour um, in, in badminton games. But they're also unique in that although they can accelerate incredibly quickly, they also decelerate incredibly quickly. So they've got some really interesting flow physics uh, and aerodynamics that go on, on with them. It's the second most popular participatory sport on the planet. Um, and it's really interesting to see that when we look at the countries around the world that are playing badminton, um, like China, South Korea, but then two European company, uh, countries appear in the, in the top 10 as well. We've got Denmark in there and, and the UK comes in at number four. And badminton's actually an incredibly popular sport uh, in the UK. If we look at the Sport England participation um, stats for the 1819 calendar year, I couldn't, I couldn't find any more up to date at the moment. Um, we see in the 1819 calendar year, some 6.5% of the population actually uh, participated in, in badminton throughout the year. You know, put it into context, 2.1% um, played netball, 31% play, uh, went swimming. You know, swimming, uh, running, I've, I've omitted off this, are, are far more popular. But this is a significant number of people who are, who are knocking um, shuttlecocks about throughout the year. Why do I work with shuttlecocks? Well, my interest really comes back to 2006. So I've been working with shuttlecocks for a long time now. In 2006, um, one of the most memorable things that happened was uh, the UK were awarded the uh, Olympic Games for London. And uh, both myself uh, with, with more hair in 2006 and uh, Professor Haig were out in Singapore um, talking to some famous footballer in a Baker foil suit, it was quite squeaky and uh, the Prime Minister at the time, Tony Blair, and his wife, Sherry Blair. Um, she's great, by the way, if you want to uh, discuss um, jet lag cures, <clears throat> I discovered at that conference. Um, but we were out in Singapore as kind of a sideshow to the uh, Olympic Games being awarded. And one of the promises that was made at the Olympic Games, which actually secured the Olympics for the UK, was that there would be a lasting legacy. And the legacy would be an increase in sports participation in the UK. Now, one thing that created was a lot of panic amongst a number of the sports because they went, well, how do we increase participation? Um, if we play badminton inside a church hall or in a school sports hall, the government aren't going to invest in infrastructure. How are we going to expand this game? The only logical uh, conclusion I could come to was to actually take the game outdoors and to try and develop an outdoor variant of the shuttle. Now, the problem is, is a shuttlecock only weighs about five grams in, in mass. It's a completely natural product, um, or the high quality ones are, I should say. You, know, you use 16 feathers 
um, you need six feathers from the left wing of a goose and you can only use six of those flight feathers for the best quality ones. They're trimmed, they're shaped, they're put into the shuttlecock. They're incredibly strong, but at the same time, they break relatively easy during a game. And for the fact that they're a natural product really dictates why they're so hard to design and why they're so hard for people to understand what goes on. So we decided to start researching them because we were trying to develop a credible um, outdoor product. We weren't the only researchers that were doing this. We took a slightly different approach though to, to a lot of researchers in that we decided to use uh, computational fluid dynamics or simulation to understand these, these delicate structures. And the nature of uh, the shuttlecock has made them incredibly difficult to understand because they are a natural product, because they have complex shape, complex form, because you can't physically see what is going on inside of them. With the approach that we use, we can actually understand how they'll behave in flight. Um, and we can start to unpick some of what's been going on. Now, in the last 15 years, we have seen a lot of researchers actually look at shuttlecocks for, for similar reasons, wanting to develop credible outdoor products. The quality of the work has been somewhat varied because they can't see what's going on within the shuttlecock. So you find a lot of the uh, studies that are being done on shuttlecocks um, make some interesting uh, assumptions and conclusions. And we've been trying to, to unpick some of that. It's worthwhile saying though, that this work doesn't just uh, relate to kind of shuttlecocks of this technique. We do use this technique in a number of other areas. In the last couple of years, we've been using uh, fluid dynamics to say not only with cyclists, but we've been doing work with physiologists within uh, the academy and we're working with speech therapists um, over at uh, the Royal Hallamshire Hospital. So it's a technique that really allows us to understand airflow and fluid movement in, in a wide range of scenarios. So I'm here really to talk about shuttlecocks and I say a number of you have seen me present on this before. So kind of what's new? What have I been up to in the last couple of years? Well, we published a paper in 2018, which um, summarized lots of the research that we've been doing and kind of all that, that detailed understanding of the flow structures. And what we've been doing since then is we've now been learning about the, the real subtle effects. So it might be looking at what happens if you change the angle that you insert a feather into a shuttlecock and how it affects the airflow going through. But we've also been understanding things such as what happens if you spin the shuttlecock, what happens across its flight. So previously simulations have been very much static, um, almost artificial, and we're now starting to couple real movement into the aerodynamics. So the spin of the shuttle, and we're looking to incorporate the turnover and the dynamic response that make these things so interesting. And this work was published um, at, the, at the Tokyo conference in a short paper. We've also been looking at um, what happens when you damage a shuttlecock. As I say, these things are incredibly fragile, but as, again, incredibly strong. The, the rachis, the, the vein of the shuttlecock uh, made of keratin um, is, is an incredibly tough material, but the vein itself we can see gets broken apart quite easily uh, throughout play. And we're starting to look at what happens to the flight of the shuttle and how much damage can you actually um, keep in a product before uh, it becomes uh, unplayable. Again, we can see some of the complex flow physics here on the left, and the differences may look subtle, but here we have on the bottom one a damaged shuttle, and you might be able to work out how or see how the, the wake, the flow structures behind the shuttle snake. And that also plays up in the forces as well. And we can see a time variation here in the amount of sideways and upwards uh, and downwards force on the shuttlecock, and it causes the shuttle, when they become damaged, to bobble about in flight which is why players don't like playing with damaged shuttlecocks. So where's all this being leading to? I said, there's a lot of research that's been going on and it still goes on. Um, it went into developing uh, a product that we're in the final stages of licensing. So it's taken 16 years nearly to get to this stage. Now, actually, that's not true. Can't do me maths. 14 years to get to this stage now. We actually do have a credible product that flies outdoors, flies well, and you can have a quality game outdoors. We're trying to get it on the market currently. I say we're in final negotiations with um, a licensee at the moment. Hopefully we'll get that over the line. It's taken a lot longer than I ever anticipated. 
The research element of this has probably only taken around about five or six years in total. The rest of the time has mostly been absorbed by uh, lawyers getting involved. It gets very messy as soon as you get lawyers from Sport England, uh, Badminton England, the Hallam, and then a licensee company. Um, we had a global financial crash, as I tell the students, um, you need a stable economy really for innovation to work well. And, and this is a case in point when uh, we had a lot of uh, funding pulled midway through. Um, and now currently we're being hampered by viruses of all things and companies um, changing the direction of their offerings. Hopefully though, we'll be able to see this on, on the market soon. And hopefully I'll be able to come back when we can all meet up again and have a physical product in the hand and we can maybe do a live demonstration in a lecture theatre. That's basically everything I wanted to say today. It has been short and brief. Over to you. Great stuff. Thanks so much, John. Uh, really interesting talk, uh, as, as always. Um, do you have any uh, questions uh, from, from the floor? Go on, Jeff. John, th thanks for that. It's been uh, really good. I've seen the uh, progression of this over the years from the outside, which has been great. The, the outdoor version, is it limited to one company or where will the, um, the IP sit for this? Um, so we currently have the, uh, the IP protected at the Hallam and we are, we are licensing the IP. Um, currently it is being licensed to one particular company, but they are a global player. Um, they have uh, stores all over Europe, all over Asia, and now within South America. Um, big blue stores, but I can't really say any more than that. Um, <clears throat> no, I know, I know who you mean. Um, yeah. And what about the, the transferability of the, the research? So you focus on shuttlecocks, but what about you know other, other outdoor sports that might benefit from it, or potential outdoor variations that might benefit? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, the, the techniques that we show here and, and the design process that we've been through, we, we translate across to a number of outdoor sports. Um, so we've been doing some work with manufacturers who are trying to create novel tennis products. Um, somebody did ask me a while back if I could design a ping pong ball that wasn't wind affected. Um, and I politely declined that one because that's just a little bit too painful, really, to um, contemplate. But the, te the technique, as you, as you saw from one of the slides that quickly flew by, it's, it's very transferable. It's not just about sport. You know, I'm working with the Royal Hallamshire Hospital to use similar techniques to understand um, swallowing reflex uh, with patients with dysphagia and how, um, you know, measurement of fluid thicknesses and bits and pieces. I've used it with forensic scientists as well. Um, and we've been providing um, validation of equipment for some of our uh, respiratory physiologists as well. Mm, great, that's excellent. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. I was just had a just a quick one. I just wondered, um, just from the initial kind of you know scoping of the project, obviously to move you know badminton to an outdoor um, environment. Um, I was wondering if you had any um, sort of any kind of thoughts on you know what the expected uptake might be if people were to kind of play you know, badminton outside um, what kind of increase in you know participation that might actually uh, bring about um i should know the answer to this one and i've literally just come from an innovation class where i was talking to my students and telling them how it's really important to bring <laughs> expertise in in specific areas including we brought in a business development manager and a grant writer um, along the way um, and we brought in sports psychologists as well to unpick what people thought about the product. Um, off the top of my head, I can't tell you the numbers. I could go back to the proposal, which was written a long time ago, and actually find them for yeah. you. What I do know is, you know, when we did testing down on the beach in, in Bournemouth, um, you know, we had loads of people come in wanting to have a go, um, you know, we know there's a market for it. It's it's just getting it getting it out there. Great stuff. Thanks, nice John. Um, any other any other final questions? Professor Weeks waving his hand quite vigorously. 
Oh, sorry, I can't see him, uh, John. Thanks for spotting uh, me, John. Thanks for that. I enjoyed, <laughs> I enjoyed that, John. Uh, always good to um, catch up on this this project. Um, really great bit of work. Um, I'm just interested in what uh, is there any space for innovation of indoor badminton shuttlecocks? Is yeah. it something that's relatively static, or is there on, are there in, ongoing innovations for indoor shuttlecocks? Um, there's not as much been going on. I mean, it's it's been subtle. The uh, it's still thought that the feather shuttlecock is the gold standard, and you find there's a certain amount. I don't want to call it snobbery within the sport, but um, without a shadow of a doubt, feather shuttlecocks behave in a unique manner. The balance, the flight behaviours, and people have been trying to recreate that for many years now with a synthetic version. Synthetic versions first appeared about 50 years ago, and we've still not managed it. The design hasn't moved on. So yeah, there is there is mileage to do things with, with the indoor products. Um, and we're hoping to uh, get in with this company to maybe do some work with their indoor products as well, eventually. I'd like to. I just wonder whether there's any, maybe maybe not, maybe it works the other way, but sort of sustainability type of, um, I, I would imagine it takes an awful lot of effort to produce a shuttlecock, and I wonder whether... Yeah, they're, they're, they're largely their lost leaders for the companies. You know, you can take up to two weeks to make a, a natural shuttlecock because of the curing times and the washing and the drying and everything. On the other hand, you know, the nylon variations, you, you pop out, you know, seconds and you've got a nylon shuttlecock made. But then also, you know, it's, it's a synthetic product. It's a plastic product. Yeah. You know, could we do something to move away from the plastics or something that, that is more um, environmentally friendly long term as well? 